I'm Steve Rose. What sets us apart is that green is not just a buzzword like a lot of people use. Green is an operative word and it really is easy to do. I'm going to share with you my secrets on how to do this at home. I believe that people want to live this way, they just don't know how to go about it. And that's the whole purpose of the show, to teach you how to do it. I'm going to show you the pathway to green living and organic cooking. Welcome to the Organic Rose. Welcome to the Organic Rose. I'm here with Dr. Ortiz, who I affectionately call Moni, since I've known her since she was born. But we're gonna talk about vet stuff. We're gonna talk about how to communicate with your pet, dog or cat, what have you. We're gonna talk about making your own dog food, your own cat food, your own treat, treats, and a lot of pet stuff. Hey, Steve. How are you? How are you? Good to see you, Monica. You as well, great. Awesome, I can't wait to learn about veterinary medicine. Oh, well, I can't wait for us to talk about it. You can teach me. I'll, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> we'll talk all about it. Good. Thanks. Let's... Come on in. Thank you. Come on in. I gotta close the door. Fantastic. So, Monica, what does it take to become a vet? Well, to become a vet, you know, first of all, you have to go through four years of college. Mm -hmm. I went to the University of Denver in Colorado and graduated there, then decided to go to veterinary school on the island of Grenada nice. um, to <laughs> St. George's <laughs> University. Um, and you do three years of actual schooling there. And then afterwards, I went to University of Tennessee, Tennessee to do my clinical year. I was there for a year. Uh -huh. And then after with that, you can go ahead and go into private practice or what I chose to do was take a year and go and do an internship at a specialty referral center um, where I was able to go through different parts of the veterinary field. So ophthalmology, oncology, neurology, and I was wow. able to rotate yeah, uh, through all those fields and kind of gain some more um, you know, understanding and education through there. After that, I did decide to go into private practice and uh, you know, get my hands wet. What made you decide to be a vet? Oh, I knew I wanted to be a vet for a really long time. We had cats growing up as uh -huh. a child and uh, they would always bring home presents, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I would do is I'd try and save those presents, you know, the little mice or, um, you know, little birds and whatnot and try and put bandages on them and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then um, after that, just kind of really fostered a love of animals. Mm -hmm. And from there, you know, I really just pursued my education forward going, you know, with the idea of wanting to become a veterinarian. What about chipping and having a microchip put into your pet? Especially, you know, if you pick up a stray cat or a stray yeah. dog, how does that whole thing work? Yeah, so microchipping, I'm glad you brought that up, is really important, um, you know, as far as whenever a stray animal is, uh, you know, brought in by a client or a rescuer, mm -hmm. we do one of a couple things. First of all, let me show you this sure. stuff right here. We have a microchip scanner, and every time a stray animal is brought in, we go ahead and we scan them for a microchip. Now, it, it's just, it reads most universal microchips, and this is an example of a microchip um, in here. And so the microchip is actually the size of a, a rice grain, and so you have to have a, a needle Put it right between the shoulder blades in the back of a yeah, <laughs> and it can be a little uncomfortable, but most pets tolerate it very, very uh -huh. well. Um, you know, and that's why you know we do recommend doing it because this can save and reunite your pet. You know, if it runs out of the house, uh -huh. you never know; someone leaves the door open. But it's quite important to microchip your pets. Um, but it's it's a really fantastic thing that we're able to provide, you know, animals. So how does it, so the, there are numbers that match up? Yeah, exactly. So um, there is a number within the microchip itself, um, and it corresponds to a uh, number that the scanner picks up. So as you can see, uh, let's say I obviously do not have a microchip. <laughs> um, if I were to wave the scanner over my arm, you do not hear a beep. But okay. if I were to wave it over the actual needle with microchip inside, you hear that beep. Oh. And there's a number that corresponds, and that actually corresponds right here to the microchip itself. Wow. This number is then you know, put into that patient or the pet's um, account. So if 
you know, we go ahead and get a phone call. Oh gosh, you know, my pet's missing. We went ahead and found her and, you know, the, um, we found a pet here and we scanned them and their numbers match. We're able to call that client and match and reunite them together. So the first time you bring your pet into a vet, what are the questions that you should be asking that vet? Oh, many questions. I think husbandry and diet are great questions mm -hmm. to ask. Uh, vaccines as well. We talk a lot about the lifestyle of a pet. As far as vaccines go, uh, you know, there are required vaccines and then there are what we call lifestyle vaccines. So vaccines are, you know, one topic to discuss. Uh, two of the required vaccines that we, you know, um, recommend um, are rabies. That's for me. You're going to yes, give me a shot exactly, today? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So be careful. Um, rabies vaccine and mm -hmm. then distemper vaccine. Those are the required vaccines. Um, and that's for be a, a dog. Okay. For a cat, rabies as well. And then a vaccine we called FERCP, which is a panleukopenia pan vaccine, upper respiratory. And then as far as the lifestyle vaccines, there's a, a couple. Leptospirosis, um, of which can be picked up um, in water yeah. by uh, wild animals urinating and defecating, and your dog or cat goes along and drinks that water. And you don't know, because our dog had that. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and you don't know that you're out walking in the park somewhere, and your dog stops to drink a little out of a puddle right out of a rain, puddle from rain and you don't yeah. know what's in there. You don't know and that's the concern. And even more concern is that leptospirosis is zoonotic, meaning it can be transmitted to us. So um, definitely something if your, your pet, you know, is within that lifestyle vaccine that they should be vaccinated. Um, a second lifestyle vaccine is Lyme, Lyme vaccine mm -hmm. and that's transmitted by ticks. So you go hiking with your pet, yeah. you know, or your, your, your pet's outdoors most of the time and there's wildlife that can come by then yeah, I would recommend strongly. And then the third lifestyle vaccine, these are for your dog, um, is the Bordetella vaccine. So if you um, decide to kennel your pet, uh -huh. or you know, does a lot of doggy daycare, or goes to the dog park a lot, kennel cough is a very, very you know, prolific um, you know, viral disease coming about, and so um, you know, having vaccine, vaccinated against that vaccine is good. So if you take your dog to a dog care place while mm -hmm. you're going, when you go to work right um, you definitely should vaccinate your pet for that correct? oh definitely yeah. and most places require it okay. so when I bring my pet to a vet what should I be asking the veterinarian I think you know questions about uh, husbandry so how mm -hmm. you're keeping the pet you know is it gonna be an outdoor indoor pet the type of food you plan on um, you know feeding this pet uh, what other pets you may have at home? Oh, I have you know another cat that maybe go outdoors and indoors. Right. Um, you know what is going to be the lifestyle of this pet? Will this pet go to different homes? Will it be a service animal? Um, you know all different questions as far as pertaining to the pet's lifestyle um, and husbandry situations. Uh -huh. I think. Do you recommend? Because I make my own dog cookies, mm -hmm. and the, why should you listen to your vet? Well, I guess... <laughs> it's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, well, we do go to, you know, specialized training for mm -hmm. all this. You know, we are considered, we are doctors. You know, we are doctors of many species, um, you know, cat's dog and whatnot. So I feel we are a wealth of information to be able to provide to you. Your pet and, you know, my patient uh -huh. is the biggest concern that we have. So communicating and having an open discussion about what you want to provide him or her and then you know what I consider to be the you know ethical and moral standards of how we should keep your pet healthy I think is the best way to go so your your veterinarian should always be accessible to you then correct? definitely definitely I'm always just a phone call away uh -huh. you know or email um, to discuss any kind of questions or concerns you know that you may have any new developments of what you know your pets doing should definitely you know be because we get these pets that are part of our family you yeah. know these are fam family members and mm -hmm. so if we have questions you know or concerns about a family member you know as a, as a human family member we would talk to our doctor so it's no different you know as far as this pet is a part of our family go ahead and give me a call I'd be more than happy to discuss any kind of questions there's no such thing as a ridiculous question at all see you are the model veterinarian <laughs> It's too bad that because there's some that aren't like like you that right. are not accessible and, and you are the best, Mark. <laughs> You're too much. <laughs>
So wet food versus dry food. Wet food, I mean canned food mm -hmm. versus dry food, like a kibble type product. Mm -hmm. Do you mix them? Do you do one or the other? What are the differences and the benefits of one over the other? Right. So I guess cost is one, you okay. know, uh, the cost of dry food is obviously going to be cheaper. It'll mm -hmm. long, you know, make it last longer mm -hmm. versus canned foods. There's a high moisture content in the canned foods, which can be better for older senior dogs, you know, if they're not drinking enough water or things like that. And as far as cats go, again, you know, cats having free access to dry food um, and the higher moisture content in canned foods, again, are better for senior cats. But again, because cats are more carnivore species, I tend to recommend perhaps doing both a dry and a canned option oh. for your cats. Um, for dogs, not necessarily, um, but uh, if you have a finicky eater who only eats canned, no matter what you can do, mm -hmm. then the dog's yeah. gonna eat canned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Do you leave? Do you recommend leaving food out for cats 24/7? I I don't. Um, you know, generally I do like meal feeding because okay. then you know if your pet's actually eating. Or if, you're feeding the neighborhood. <laughs> exactly, exactly, or the dog as well. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. So. Um, you know, if you have the, one of those free feeder cat dispensers and you come into my office and say, oh, you know, Fluffy's losing some weight, is she, he or she eating, I might ask, and they say, oh, well, I have the free feeder. Well, that doesn't really give us an indication of whether or not, you know, Fluffy's actually been eating. Right, because you don't know. You don't know. And so having kind of an actual amount put in the bowl, we're able to measure exactly, yes, you know, she's eating or she's eating less or she's eating much more to be able to quantify yeah. you know, where we're at. So I do like meal feeding. Steve, so this is actually a meal for that I prepare for my dog, not for you. You're not allowed to <laughs> have I'm any. Starving. I know, can't have any. It's oh. for the dog. It's for the dog. So this is a, a meal that I prepare for her. Mm -hmm. um, it's a recipe that I get from a company called balanceit.com. Um, and it's a couple of ingredients here. You can choose as many as you'd like on there. And what's great about the um, website is that you it formulates an entire meal plan for you with their added supplement that you add in it to make it whole and balanced. Nice. As far as what, I have a 20 pound dog and mm -hmm. she's eight years old. So as far as the ingredients that balanceit.com, um, you know, I chose specifically which ingredients I'd like to add. Okay. And so I chose um, some chicken, which uh -huh. is a chicken breast, skinless, boneless, and roasted, which they, you know, had stated in the recipe that uh -huh. that's how they wanted it prepared. Um, and it's about four and three eighths ounce of chicken breast, um, some quinoa, a quarter of a cup cooked, um, some uh, cauliflower uh, cooked in drains without salt, without salt, that's a quarter of a cup there, uh -huh. some walnut oil, two and an eighth tablespoon. What about this guy? Um, so yes, yeah, so then the apple um, helps. Again, these are all kind of carbohydrates and um, added vitamins and nutrients. You can okay. make a meal just strictly off of, you know, just the chicken and the carb, like the quinoa. Uh -huh. But I particularly wanted to change it up um, for her and add some, you know, a vegetable. So I should go ahead and start cutting this apple. Yep. Then. So I need a quarter of a cup. So that's about about you know half an apple there um, to provide her. And um, we're going to use it. It's going to be raw, so it's going to be skin okay. on as well. Okay. Um, and that'll be a quarter of a cup along with the cauliflower walnut oil. And then again, this is the balanceit.com uh, supplement. Um, and that's gonna be uh, one and five eight tablespoons that I added to the meal there. So does she like apples? She does. So I'll put those in the bottom then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Well, she loves chicken, she loves all this stuff. So um, it's, it's not, you know, what she loves most is that it's just fresh. Uh -huh. um, and it's, I do tend to change it every day. Um, to provide her, I feed her twice a day. Um, so she gets a different meal or a little change in the meal on the daily. Is that a good thing? Because some people feed their pets twice a day and some say that, no, you're only supposed to feed once a day. 
Um, it really depends. I like to feed them twice a day mm -hmm. um, because I feel like giving a one large bulk meal kind of tends to weigh my, my pets down. Yep. Um, as far as the science behind it, I think spreading out meals helps with metabolism, um, you know, and maintaining that kind of energy level as well. Go ahead and add that. Awesome. And then we'll go ahead and add some of the chicken. I like to kind of layer it. That's just me, you know, as far uh -huh. as different um, food ingredients in there. So some of the quinoa. And then again, some of the cauliflower. And then a little bit of the oil. And then we'll go ahead and do a little bit more of that too. Yep. And then sprinkle some of this Yep, out. definitely. And then we'll kind of mix all the rest in there. Again, it's human grade food, so we're just using it. It's all normal, so you can get your hands dirty, your hands uh -huh. wet. I mean, you're making this with love anyway, so why not put love into the food? So, this is the meal that Dr. Ortiz has prepared for her dog, Chai. So she's gonna bring Chai in, and let's see if Chai likes this. I think she will. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> she is. Hi, sweetie. Uh, she hates to be picked up. <laughs> <laughs> well, put her right. over here and then she, let's, let's hey, right. scooch behind me. Hi, sweetie pie. What, what do, do you, you have think? there? Huh? She loves it. Yeah, mm -hmm. she does. Yeah, so she gets this meal. I feed it to her twice a day. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, you know, she does have bowel movements regularly uh -huh. as a result. And um, she really enjoys it, you know, and I enjoy making it for her. Yeah, I'll I bet. Do. Well, I have learned so much from you, Monica, today. It's amazing. Well, thank I mean, you so much for coming. Oh, and thank you so much for being part of the Organic Rose. It's, um, yeah, you've you just given me so much knowledge. That oh, of course. I'm going to go home and make some dog cookies. Would you? I'm going to bring one some back for you, too. Oh, she yeah, would love them. Back. She would cookies. love them. Hmm? Well, thank right, you so well, much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monica. Take care. I will, and we'll talk to you really soon. Perfect. I just got back from Dr. Monica Ortiz's veterinary office, and she's my favorite vet. So we talked about your pet's health, whether they be dog or cat, and uh, we talked about diets for animals and your pets, and about making your own diets for your, for your pets, you know, dinner, your, their lunch, their breakfast, what have you. And that's a great idea. You can use super fresh ingredients and give them just some really good nutritious whole foods. But when you attempt to do this, make sure that you clear the recipe by your vet before you do that. You want to make sure that everything you're feeding your pet is good for them. So this is going to be a pumpkin based dog cookie or cats can eat it as well. So we are going to start with a couple of eggs. And these are organic cage free eggs. And we're gonna mix it with a little bit of canned pumpkin. But make sure when you buy this that it's canned pumpkin and not pumpkin pie filling because pumpkin pie filling has a lot of things you don't want your pets to have. A lot of sugars, a lot of different spices. Okay, now we're gonna whisk this together. Okay, and then next we're gonna go ahead and start adding some of the whole wheat flour. Two and a half cups actually, which is quite a bit. Okay. So this recipe takes about an hour in a 350 degree oven. But I guarantee you that your pets will love this. They'll probably be standing outside the door just staring at you while you make it. And it also fills the home with a, your kitchen with really wonderful aromas of pumpkin. Very reminiscent of Thanksgiving. I mean, you could get really fancy schmancy too and get 
go to any baking supply house and they'll have lots of different forms that you can use or cutters that are in the shape of dogs or cats or bones or whatever. But I just use this perf cutter and it works just fine for me. And you know what? My dog doesn't really care what shape it is in. He just wants to eat it. Add a little more milk. And we'll add the salt in a little bit right now too. Okay, we're almost there. You can use, I've made this recipe before using chechi bean flour that works pretty well if your dog or cat have gluten intolerance issues. Okay. So now the fun part. So I just need to kind of mix it around gently in the bowl. And they're not going to rise at all because there's no baking powder, no, no yeast in this at all. That's what it looks like. I'm going to pick up all the flour that's left in there. So now it's time to roll it out. We'll take some of the flour, the same flour that we used. And you notice I put a, a cloth on my rolling pin as well. We'll rub that down with some flour. And what this does is this is going to prevent any of the dough from sticking to the, to the pin. Continue. So these are pastry cloths that I'm using on the pin, the rolling pin and on the, on the board, on the chopping block. And it just prevents the, the, simply prevents the dough from sticking to any of these surfaces. Okay. I'm glad it didn't stick too, because it would have proven me wrong. No, but anytime you're doing any kind of baking, whether it's bread or pizza dough, it's a great idea to invest in some pastry cloths and it just makes your job a lot easier. And a little bit of releasing spray. Okay. What I'm going to do is take this huh, dough cutter put it over there. So this is the crimper. And it's a very simple tool. It's just a wheel, little waffles on it. And it's got a, a nut on the other end that you can tighten it or loosen it. To, that'll govern your speed of it. So just nice and slowly, whatever size you want. Obviously depends on the size of your dog or your cat. Somebody was telling me that the batch I make for, for my dog, also, who weighs a little over 100 pounds, would be enough to feed their dog for a year. Okay, so there it's perforated. And you don't perforate all the way through, just, just gently pierce the top of it, the surface. And now it's going to go into the oven for an hour. Through the magic of television, we have this. Smells really good. So now what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and break them right at the perforation. And the next place these are gonna go is into Oso, who's my dog's name, into his cookie jar. So that's about as easy as it gets making dog cookies.
You're good. That was super easy. Your dogs and cats are going to love these. I'll catch you next time on The Organic Rose. Next time on The Organic Rose, everybody loves pizza and we have a local expert who will show us how to make the best pizza from scratch.